Well, good evening. Hope I live up to that. Uh, doing better every time, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for having me again. Um, all right. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the uh, famous boxer Muhammad Ali. He grew up in Louisville. He was famous boxer. Uh, he won 56 times in his professional boxing career and was the heavyweight champion of the world. Uh, and this one time he was on a plane going somewhere and uh, the flight attendant was walking down the aisle like checking seat belts, making sure everyone's okay. Do you have water, peanuts, all this kind of stuff. She stopped at Ali and asked him to put a seat belt on. Muhammad Ali looks back at her and says, Superman doesn't need a seat belt. And quickly, the flight attendant said back to him, Superman doesn't need a plane either. <laughs> and I don't know about y'all in that situation, but had I been Muhammad Ali in that point, I would have been just, I'm, I'm going to walk back, just uh, put my seatbelt on, not say anything. I'm being real humbled right now. But uh, so that's humility is kind of the key topic we're going to be on tonight. And that'll be coming from 1 Peter 5. Um, so in this passage, Peter is encouraging Christians and reminding them of what it takes to shepherd and disciple people for the kingdom of God. Yeah, he puts a great deal of emphasis on that and the idea of training up a believer to a greater understanding of the King of Kings, of the Lord of Lords. Uh, Scott Long, a few weeks ago in his sermon on discipleship, described, de described discipleship as this. Discipleship is a life-on-life -life process relationship, teaching people to know and follow Jesus for the purpose of them replicating the process with others. And so we see the super the relational aspect of discipleship. It's a one-on-one -on -one thing, so you know each other. I'll, I'll know whoever I'm discipling. They'll know me. We'll have that bond. And when arrogance and pride gets into that bond, it hurts it. It kills it. And so that's why humility is so important here, and that's kind of what Peter is going into right here. Uh, so the three major points that we're going to kind of hit on tonight and that we'll see throughout this passage are as follows. The first point is that humility puts God's plan above our own plan. And this is just a quick overview. We'll go back to these points in a minute. Uh, the second point is humility allows us to see our weaknesses while highlighting the strength of God. And the third point, humility shows us the need for restoration. So we'll jump into the passage right now. It's uh, 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 11. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when, you're, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you to him be the to him be the dominion forever and ever 
Amen. So the first point that we're hitting on tonight is that humility puts God's plan above our own. And we see that starting in verse 5, that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So God, through Peter, is saying that we are called to live humbly and that the only way to live in a right relationship with God is to be humble, is to show humility. Because living pridefully is to live in direct contradiction to how God has called us to live. We are called to humility because it is the only way that we can completely glorify him. And so what happens when we're prideful? What are the things that happen? What, what negativity comes from that? Is that when we are proud, we are saying that our plan is better than God's plan. And when we have these moments during the day where we're being prideful, we're being arrogant and just boasting the things that we have and boasting our own, in our own abilities and saying that, hey, we know how to do this better or, hey, we know how to build that better or whatever it may be, we are saying that our knowledge and our plan is better than God's plan. And that we are also saying that we are more powerful than God. And when we are prideful is when we are more likely to fall into other sins. The, uh, the Biblical Counseling Coalition put out an article on pridefulness and the negative aspects that it has in our life and how it just affects every aspect of our hearts and our minds and ourselves. Uh, this is the quote from there. The heart of pride is focused on self. Prideful people believe they deserve better than what life has brought them. They become sorrowful, resentful, and even jealous of other people and their successes. Pride breeds self-pity, which is a major comp component in depression. Typically, people who struggle with pride will live life based on how they feel and expect everyone else to accommodate them and adapt to their moods. So our pridefulness is a heart issue that brings along with it all kinds of other issues and that prevent us from being able to fully and wholly share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because when we are prideful, it steals the glory of God and puts it on ourselves. And when we're prideful in that process, we're not discipling others for God, we're discipling disciples for ourselves. We're making people to follow us and not follow after Jesus. And so this is why we have to keep our pride in check. This is why we must be humble in all of our circumstances, whether our circumstances are great to the point where we don't have to worry about anything, any physical needs, or whether our circumstances are much less than that. We must be humble in those because humility is what allows us to live in proper relationship with God, what helps us to resist sin, and what helps us to live out the Great Commission. And so moving on to verse 6, we're not going to spend that long on every verse, sorry. <laughs> uh, verse 6, uh, Peter's command for humility, so that the, at the right time, God may exalt us. So we see in this that God rewards humility. God will not exalt the prideful, but God will exalt the humble. And like I said, pride takes honor away from God, and pride puts our plan and our desires at a greater level than God and his desires for our lives. So an important thing to remember is that God's plan is greater than our plan, that he does know exactly what he is doing, and then every circumstance, everything that we face is by his will. And so we see many places throughout scripture that God knows all and whatever he decrees is what happens. And nothing we say or ever will do will override that. Nothing we can possibly do will change who God is, will change his plan. Uh, and a perfect example of this, if we look over at Isaiah 46 and verses 8 through 11. Isaiah 46, 8 through 11. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country. 
I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed, and I will do it. So the, these verses just illustrate who God is, the power that he has, and what he is able to do. And so do you really think that the God who created all of this, who can command a bird to fly across the sky, who can command anyone to do anything, do you think that our desires can really override that? And the answer is no. That is a trick and that is a lie from the devil that he, te- that he tries to make us accept is that we can change God, but we cannot. And so when we, are, when we are prideful, we are saying that our knowledge is greater than God's. We are saying that our needs and are greater than God or that our needs are greater than others' needs. We are saying that our plan is greater than the plan of God. And so our humility is what allows us to properly minister to those around us. Our humbleness is what allows us to honor God and to honor other people. And we are, when we are humble, God will exalt us. God will lift us up. And when we live a life of humility, the next several verses that we're about to see come so much easier for us to live out practically. And so that leads us to our second point, is that humility allows us to see our weaknesses while highlighting God's strength. So we ver- jump down to verse, uh, verse 7, which uh, speaks on anxiety. Verse 7 again is, calling, casting all anxieties on him because he cares for you. So anxiety plagues many people. I don't know how many of us in here have struggled with anxiety, but I, I to an extent have. I've known many people to struggle with it. And uh, we're naturally just an anxious people. We want to know what's next. We want comfort. We want to know everything right now. We want to know how situations are going to play out. We want to know, will I have this later? And when we don't know these things, we become fearful. We become worrisome. And to the very point where it can destabilize our lives and negatively negatively affect every aspect of our being. And so the key to anxiety is humility, which seems counterproductive. But if we look at, uh, look at everything else that we've seen right here, our humility allows us to say, I know that these problems are great, and I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I am okay with these things because I know that I can give all of my troubles all of my burdens, all of my worries to God. And I know that he will care for me. And I know that God is greater than these griefs. I know that God is greater than my suffering. I know that God is greater and that he cares deeply for me. So when we are able to show humility, casting our anxieties on God becomes so much easier. When we are able to show humility, we are able to give our worries, our needs, our cares to God And we know that regardless what happens, he will always care for us. So on to verse 8, the being watchful. Uh, Verse 8 says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And so humility is also the key to helping us accomplish Peter's goal for us in verse 8. So we are called to be on guard and to resist the devil and his schemes. Pride says we are too strong to fall. We are too good to fall. And going back to the Muhammad Ali quote on the airplane, like we are not going to be affected by the plane crashing without our seatbelt on, or we are not going to be affected by turbulence without a seatbelt on. That's what pride tells us is that we are greater than these other things. And another example of that is King David. We see this in 2 Samuel 10 when he fell into temptation and had an affair with Bathsheba, uh, resulting in her becoming pregnant and then ultimately him having his, her husband killed. And so this idea of pride, or this pride crept into David's life, and he became very arrogant and prideful to the point where he didn't think that anything could happen to him. Like He is up here. This godly man who we see so throughout scripture being exalted and saying how godly he is. He even wrote much of the Old Testament and many Psalms, but he fell. He let pride get to him. He let that affect his life so negatively. 
And so we see that in today's culture as well. We see, especially recently, we've seen many leaders, especially of the Christian faith, like fall. They will commit these sexual sins or other types of sins, and we, they fall. Uh, and that's all due to pride and letting their position, letting their power get to them. And uh, we see this explicitly stated also in Proverbs sixteen eighteen, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall, before a fall. So our pride will lead us to destruction. Our pride will lead us to fall like the people that we have seen in these stories. So we must remain humble and we must be ready for the attacks from Satan and our temptations to sin. We must resist the devil. We must be firm in our faith no matter what happens. In all circumstances, we must be ready to fight the attacks of Satan. These attacks and temptations come in many forms, and many are brought on by temptation to be prideful, and many are brought on by suffering. So our humility allows us to better prepare ourselves for battle with these temptations to sin. And so how, how do we prepare ourselves? This is our, pre- sorry, our preparation comes from Paul's letter in Ephesians, uh, verses 6 through 10, where we are talked about putting on the armor of God, putting on the shield of God so that we can resist the devil. Verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in, his, and in the strength of his might. Pull on, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And so how do we do this? This means... Our armor and our shield is the scriptures. Our armor and our shield is being in the word and being in communion with God. That is how we resist the devil. And Jesus, in his 40 days in the wilderness, he was tempted many times by the devil to question God and question the power of God, but he didn't. And every time the devil tempted him, he came back with scripture and said, you shall not test the Lord your God. And so that is how we are to fight the devil as well. We must, be in his, we must be in the word of God, and we must be in communion with him. And so when we are able to do this, we are able to live out God's command, to, God's command of humility for our life. And moving on to the third point, humility shows us the need for restoration. And verses 10 and 11 say this, And after you have suffered a little while, The God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So Peter tells us that through our obedience, through our suffering, and through our humility, the God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory, will restore you. He will confirm you, strengthen you, and establish you. So why is this important? Why why do we need to know this? Is that because without God's restoration, without God's confirmation, without his strengthening or establishing of us, we are nothing. We are prideful, we are arrogant, we are sinful, and we do not deserve him to redeem us. We do not deserve anything that he's given us or anything that he offers us because we are sinful and he is not. It is because of our, his faithfulness that we can be redeemed. It is because of his faithfulness and his promise that he has given us that we can be redeemed. It is because of the humility of Jesus Christ who humbled himself. Now that's the whole great thing about this passage is that we know that God's not just calling us to be humble just because he wants us to be humble. He's calling us to be humble because Jesus Christ, God himself, was humble. He humbled himself. He was the God. He, he, he is God. He is over all creation. He had the power to do whatever he wants. And he came down here. He humbled himself to be a man. He came down from his throne to come to earth to humble himself, to die on a cross, and to be. He came back. Sorry, I forgot my word. Uh, he died on a cross and was resurrected, and that is, where the, that is where the power is right there. He was humbled to the point that he did all that, and so that is why we must be humble as well, to be more like him. 
So he came down from heaven, died, and rose again so that we can be restored, be confirmed, be strengthened, and be established. And that all it takes for us to be saved is to recognize that Jesus did those things. It is to accept him as our personal Lord and Savior and to repent of our sins and follow him. So this command of humility is exactly what we have, exactly what we need in order to best follow him, in order to best disciple others, in order to best give all of our fears and our anxieties to God, and to best fight the devil's temptations against us. All right. I didn't land the plane super very well, but uh, let's pray. Dear Lord, I just thank you, God, for your word. I thank you for your promise and God, your humility and the command for humility for us, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we we would be a humble people, Father, that we would be exalted at the right time because of the humbleness that we have shown. And I pray that through our humbleness that we would be able to cast all of our anxieties on you because we know that you care for us. And I pray, Lord, Lord, that you would help us to be sober-minded, to be watchful, and to resist the schemes of the devil. And that we would do that by preparing ourselves in your word, by preparing ourselves through our communion and our prayers to you. And so that after all this time, after our suffering, that we will be redeemed into the glory of Christ. And that we will always be with you for eternity, Lord. And I thank you for that promise that you've given us. And Lord, right now I just lift up all the many prayer requests that we had tonight, Father. I just pray that you would be with all of uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ and also those that aren't. And I pray that you would bring healing, God, and I pray that you would bring comfort among those. And Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity, and I pray, Lord, that you would be with us this week, be with us this coming month in all of our endeavors, and Lord, just help us to follow after you more and more every day, God. I pray all this in the holy and precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen.